on this special edition. It is amazing to think that they can go in and rob a store or a department store in broad daylight. Then they get away with it all the time. It's a new breed of burglar, and the emphasis is on diversion. The whole objective is to distract the employees in the store so that one or two people can make their way to, like, an office area or where the money is kept. We'll show you just how brazen they can be. They're good. They are. They're, they're smooth. They're good. And you don't even know what's going on. I did something that I had no right to do, morally or legally. School teacher Mary Letourneau is in jail paying for her crime. Now her teenage lover wants payback from the school. Could a new lawsuit turn these lovers against each other? Billy is having a hard time coping, and he's depressed, and he's confused, and he's not sure how this is all going to shake out and where he's going to fit in in life. And what surprises does Mary Letourneau have in store? Litigation often makes for strange good fellows. Does this whole unanswered um, mystery just hanging over the household, and it stays there. 21 years ago, her son, Aton Pates, left home for school and was never seen again. Now, could there finally be a break in the case of Aton Pates? Now, on Special Edition, from our MSNBC studios, here's Lori Dew. The classroom romance between teacher Mary Kay Letourneau and her teenage student, Vili Fulau, remains a national scandal. She is in prison for rape. He is trying to raise their two children. But there's a new twist to the story, the young father's demands. We begin with Mary Kay's confession. Here's David Gregory. I did something that I had no right to do, morally or legally. It was wrong, and I am sorry. I give you my word that it will not happen again. Please. We all know Mary Letourneau. When she began a sexual affair with a schoolboy, she crossed into forbidden territory and paid dearly for it. I led the relation. I made the first move. She said no a couple times. And we just, and then after that, we just started talking a lot to each other. Started being friends a lot. Billy Fulau, a boy who thought he was a man, but the state of Washington thought otherwise. These mismatched lovers were brought together by passion. One barely old enough to understand illicit love, another too obsessed to stay away from. I felt that I very much needed the relationship. I also felt that he needed the relationship. We were kind of wondering who this teacher could be and could our child, you know, be involved in something like this? Could this ever happen to us? Greg Olson is a Seattle crime writer and author of a book on Mary Kay Letourneau, If Loving You is Wrong. You know, I was never really sure that I could really tell the story effectively until, uh, you know, very late in the game. I was almost probably halfway through the manuscript when I got a call from Mary Letourneau. Olson says the call came in July 1998. When it was announced that she was pregnant with her baby and that I had, you know, in pregnant behind bars, I l wrote her a letter and said I was doing a book. And finally I got a call. I, I was, uh, you know, hunkering down, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And this little voice called me, Mary, you know, the call from prison. And we talked probably, while I was just finishing up the book, it was every night for several hours a night. I mean, she'd be on the phone and I'd be asking her questions and correcting and, you know, getting a few quotes and things like that for the book. The conversations went on for weeks, six weeks, Olson says. Olson also claims he wasn't the only person Letourneau was speaking to from the prison payphone. Though forbidden to contact him, 
Olson says Mary was calling her student lover at a friend's house. Prison was a far cry from where their relationship began. Letourneau was the boy's second grade teacher. She encouraged his artistic ability over the years and taught him again in sixth grade. Billy spent a lot of time at the Letourneau home. Then, somehow, one night, their friendship took a turn to the taboo. Well, the truth is, at the time, I did have a crush on her. And I was out front with her, told her everything. Um, all my feelings I had about her. Um, and we just fell in love somehow. In 1997, Mary struggled to explain her feelings to Dateline's Margaret Larson. In my mind, he wasn't an age. Um, I think when we have close relationships with people, we value the relationship for completely outside of what's, what someone's age is. She said that he was a great warrior, that he was masterful and commanded her in every way that a man should command a woman, that she was uh, really uh, subservient to him, and she thought that role was natural for men and women. But Olson believes Mary was blinded by her obsession. Billy's a typical teenager. He's no more uh, special or different than any other kid in the class. He, is a, uh, he has some artistic talent, but uh, he's 16 years old, and he thinks like a teenager and acts like one. According to Olson, Billy Fula was not the man Mary romanticized him to be. He says Mary wrote her young lover a letter threatening castration if he did not remain true to her. Although how the letter, along with others, reached the boy remains a mystery, it cost Mary four months in solitary confinement. She says they were never supposed to be sent out. She's, she, her story is that, you know, a cellmate found the letters and thought they would be worth something and sent them out. And there has been some of that. Some cellmates have, you know, traded on their friendship with Mary Letourneau to make money. A month after first speaking to Mary, Olson says he received another unexpected call a group of seven teachers, Letourneau's former colleagues, were ready to break their silence about the case. Olson claims he was stunned by what they told him. None of them had ever talked before, and they met seven of them at a public library in a little conference room, and they just unloaded. And what they told me pretty much shocked me. According to Greg Olson, Mary's fellow teachers at the Shorewood Elementary School told him they suspected an unusual relationship between Letourneau and the boy. After the fact, Olson says, they told him they regretted doing nothing, telling no one. They talked about uh, seeing them dance together, and one teacher actually went up to Mary and tapped her on the shoulder and said, you're getting too close to that kid. You better knock it off. People are talking. One teacher reportedly told Olson that the school's janitor met Mary as she was coming out of a bathroom late one night. Billy was inside the girls' bathroom, and Mary had made some sort of an excuse. Well, he's just having a hard time, and I need to help him out. One teacher talked about how uh, Mary was supposed to be in a staff meeting, and she left, said, I have to go take care of a student's needs. She was gone for 45 minutes, and when she came back, the teacher said she walked by me, and she smelled like sex. And she had been out in that van with Billy Fulau for 45 minutes, and this teacher said, you know, I thought just one second it flashed through my mind that maybe she was having sex in that van with that kid, but I couldn't believe it. I couldn't accept that Mary Kay Letourneau would be doing something like that. And why not? Olson believes it was because Letourneau, despite being diagnosed with a personality disorder, could be extremely persuasive, as he says he discovered in their many phone conversations. There's something about Mary. Uh, people uh, are fascinated by her and interested in her, and she knows that. She can convince you that, you know, maybe she does love this boy, and maybe he loves her, and maybe it's none of our damn business. And then you hang up the phone and you, you tell your wife or somebody who wasn't listening to her, hey, I'm thinking this now, and they'll say, boy, you're nuts. Olson's book is full of dark details about Mary's life before and during her affair with Billy. Olson says Mary told him her marriage to husband Steve Letourneau was failing. She was spending long afternoons and evenings at school with her student lover. 
From the moment Mary's affair was discovered, her career and life were in ruin. Steve Letourneau has moved their children to Alaska. I know in my heart that she loves them. I know in my heart that uh, she used to be a different person. Amazingly, Olsen says the one thing Mary still counts on is a future with Billy. During Olsen's one prison visit with Letourneau, he says he asked her about the wedding band she wears. She said, if Billy and I are married. We got married on Mercer Island, uh, you know, suburb of Seattle, and uh, had a ceremony that's been blessed. We're married. But you know, what she wants more than anything now, I'll tell you, is Billy to step forward and really marry her. I mean, Mary wants clemency. And she thinks the way she can get it is to have Billy Pulau step up to the plate and say, I love this woman. She's the mother of my babies, and I want the court to allow me to marry her. Billy, now 16, is helping his mother care for his and Mary's two daughters. Last year, he cooperated with a French publisher who paid him $250,000 for his story, a book to which Mary also contributed. What I saw was, here's Mary's chapter about her love and how sensitive this boy is and how wonderful he is. And then his chapter was graphic. I mean, he was talking about all the places they did it, you know, and then we went over here and did it there, you know. Um, the two of those things together wasn't right. It didn't, it didn't come off, the, I think, the way anybody that was trying to win her any kind of sympathy would have wanted. But the lawyers did push for that. They did want that graphic sex element in there because they thought it would sell copies. But the final judgment about this school teacher's relationship with her student may best be summed up by Mary herself before she was sentenced in November 1997. It is true, it is real, and it was love, and it is love. Is it the kind of love, um, is there any space for that in our society? Maybe not. Shouldn't be punished for being in love with you. She'll never acknowledge that it was wrong. You know, if loving you is wrong, for her the answer is no. You know, loving him was the rightest thing she ever did. But is there something that could turn these lovers into adversaries? When Special Edition returns, how Billy is coping as a father and how he wants payback. Billy is having a hard time coping and he's depressed and he's confused and he's not sure you know, how this is all going to shake out and where he's going to fit in in life because, uh, you know, he was a dad at uh, 13 and uh, it's tough. You know, he doesn't go out and hang out with his friends as much as he used to. He, you know, he can't. He's got to stay home with these two little girls. Special edition continues now with today's Snapshot in the News. Regis Philbin wants everyone to dress like a million. The host of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire now has his own line of clothing called, appropriately enough, the Regis Collection. Regis says he'll have a hand in picking colors and he'll get a cut of every item sold. The company projects sales will be $50 million in the first year. Now once again, here's Lori Duke. She was the 30-something Seattle school teacher, and he was her teenage lover. If loving him was wrong, Mary Kay Letourneau didn't want to be right. Their union produced two children. But is there something that could now turn them against each other? The next chapter in this story could be played out in court. Here's Chris Jansing. I felt that I very much needed the relationship. I also felt that he needed the relationship. But there is no real relationship. Three years after that interview, Mary Kay Letourneau is halfway through a seven-year prison term. And Vili Fulau lives the day-in, day-out life of a single parent. At the age of 16, he stays home with his mother, taking care of two young daughters. Writer Greg Olson, the author of a book about their case, still keeps in touch with the Fulau family through their attorney. Vili is having a hard time coping, and he's depressed and he's confused and he's not sure, you know, how this is all going to shake out and where he's going to fit in in life because, uh, you know, he was a dad at uh, 
13, and uh, it's tough. You know, he doesn't go out and hang out with his friends as much as he used to. He, you know, he can't. He's got to stay home with these two little girls. According to David Gerke, once Letourneau's lawyer and now a close friend, child care bills for the two little girls have been expensive. You can love them to death, but if you don't have money to clothe them and feed them, and when you've got two young ones, it's a horrible expense. Gerke says that to help meet the bills, the teenager and his mother are filing suit against the school district and the town of Des Moines, Washington. In a strange twist of fate, Vili Fulau and Mary Kay Letourneau could wind up on opposite sides of a bitter legal fight. The lawsuit charges that the school district failed in its duty to supervise and monitor Letourneau's activities. The Fulaus will have to prove that Mary Letourneau was a bad and irresponsible teacher. And according to David Gerke, who visited her behind bars days after the case was filed, Letourneau is very upset. She thinks it's somehow an, uh, an attack on the relationship, on the love uh, that her and Billy had for each other. She may take an unusual step from behind prison walls to save her relationship and her reputation. It does not uh, strike me as odd that Mary might end up siding with the school district. You know, litigation um, often makes for strange bedfellows in the context of interests aligning themselves. Patricia Buchanan is the attorney for the school district. She says the Fulaus have no reason to challenge Letourneau's competence. The performance evaluations were always superb, above average. There were no complaints about her. But what about the teacher's suspicions that she was having sex with a 12-year-old student? When Mary was first arrested, the district did do an investigation and it did speak with all of the teachers and asked back then in February of 97 and shortly thereafter, were you aware of anything? Did you see anything? And consistently the answer was no, the answer was no. A big difference from what Greg Olson says some of those teachers told him anonymously. They claimed to have spotted Fulau and Latorno slow dancing together, spending time together in a school bathroom and staying alone in her classroom as late as 10 o'clock at night. As far as the district is aware, there was never any slow dancing. As far as the district is aware, there was never any, um, I think you mentioned a bathroom incident. Those things did not happen. But off school property, at a marina, someone spotted the boy with Letourneau parked in her van at 3 in the morning. At that point, the school district was informed and took action. They knew about the incident at the marina where they were caught Mary and Billy in the back of the van. They knew all of that. And if your child is caught in the back of a van with a teacher at three in the morning, I would want my school district to do something about it. Neither Fulau nor his mother would comment on camera. But in a printed statement, their attorney says the facts are largely undisputed and that a 12-year-old boy has been cheated of his youth and he and his mother have been saddled with the economic and emotional responsibilities of two children born of the illegal relationship. Although two books have already been written about the case, Mary Letourneau is now working on her own version, and a Seattle court has ruled that she'll be entitled to the royalties. She believes that there's a lot of Mary Kay Letourneau money out there available to her, that she will sell her story, to the highest bidder or to a book publisher, and she'll make money on her own. And I think she believes that. And her former lawyer says Letourneau still hopes she'll be back with Billy Fulau someday. If Mary didn't believe that there was going to be a storybook ending, can you imagine how it would be to be in prison? She knows that, that storybook ending is going to be there. That's how she survives. Don't ever count Mary Letourneau out. You'll see her in the news again. Um, maybe it'll be her wedding to Billy. These people are, you know, they're fed by this media and this attention, and they aren't going to stop. I mean, Letourneau lives. It is true, it is real, and it was love. The Seattle court also ruled that Letourneau may have unsupervised visits with her six children. That includes the two she had with Billy. Mary Letourneau's prison sentence, incidentally, ends in 2004. We'll be right back. In one of his alleged confessions, he told this cellmate, in fact, he drew a map 
Now, investigators took that map from that cellmate, brought it to an FBI lab, and a handwriting expert confirmed that the handwriting was Jose Ramos. A trip to the North Pole is no walk in the park. The mission, should you choose to accept it, is very difficult, even under the most ideal conditions. But one man felt the need to put himself to the test. Here's Robert Hager. Gus McCloud, former CIA agent. His life full of adventure, but this was to be his greatest of all. Let's light it. Okay, buddy. Clear. In his 60-year-old single-engine biplane, once used as a crop duster, he's trying to become first ever to fly to the North Pole in an open cockpit, exposed to the elements. Why would anyone want to do that? The early explorers have always been my heroes, and I kind of always wanted to relate to them. And there's not a lot of aviation's first left to do. These pictures from a camera fixed on the wing looking back, and another camera in a second National Geographic Society plane trailing to document the trip. 3,500 miles. Six stops over 12 days in sometimes horrible weather. We ran into a complete wall of whiteout, and the temperature dropped 15 degrees. I was nearly frozen to death, and the airplane was leaking oil like a sieve. Now the final leg to the North Pole. Jagged ice below. Temperature minus 34. Wind over the open cockpit 100 miles an hour. That was sort of brutal and punishment that I don't want to ever go through again. It's hard to describe how cold that can get. Are you so cold that you really can't think of anything but cold? It's, it's numbing. Radio working only intermittently. But suddenly he gets the message through to the chase plane. He's there. Okay, I've got a stuck in the pole. Then circles again, and a third time. Looking around, that was probably the only time in the trip where the cold, the pain of the cold didn't matter much. I was kind of having a good time. The chase plane now confirms the feat. From everybody in this aircraft, Congratulations for flying the North Pole. McLeod lands 36 miles away at a research base. His engine's quitting, and he has to leave the plane behind. Fly back home in other planes, but his mission's a success. You made it, man. Yeah. Way to go. Pole. Are you shocked? No. Not shocked, only proud. Once these quests get into your soul, you can't quench it. It's like a fire that won't stop burning until you do it. So I think the fire is over. The ex-spy and his crop duster that made it to the top of the globe. All, he says, for the spirit of adventure. That was NBC's Robert Hager reporting. For the complete story of this expedition, you can watch National Geographic TV on CNBC Sunday, July 4th. June 4th, rather. We'll be right back. Special edition continues with... It is amazing to think that they can go in and rob a store or a department store in broad daylight. Then they get away with it all the time. It's a new breed of burglar, and the emphasis is on diversion. The whole objective is to distract the employees in the store so that one or two people can make their way to, like, an office area or where the money is kept. We'll show you just how brazen they can be. They're good. They are. They're, they're smooth. They're good. And you don't even know what's going on. There's this whole unanswered uh, mystery just hanging over the household, and it stays there. 21 years ago, her son, Eitan Pates, left home for school and was never seen again. Now, could there finally be a break in the case of Eitan Pates? Once again, here's Lori Dew. Welcome back to Special Edition. Picture a robbery where brazen burglars burst in and make off with the loot. Our next story is about a new kind of break-in. There's a certain rhythm to these rip-offs, carefully choreographed with the emphasis on diversion, as you will see, because the robbers have all been caught on tape. Here's Lee Thompson. When you think of burglary, you probably conjure up a picture of thieves prowling around in the night, creeping off with valuables when no one is around. 
you certainly don't think of broad daylight. But believe it or not, some of these shoppers, police say, are brazen crooks. They're about to steal thousands of dollars from right under the noses of clerks and shoppers. They were caught on this Florida grocery store surveillance tape and on this Ohio store video. I really didn't have any clue what was about to happen. Marla Fairchild was managing this convenience store near Toledo, Ohio, when someone on this store tape was able to make off with $4,000 in under three minutes. And I opened up the safe and the money bag wasn't there. At that point, I heard the door open, I looked up and in walked my boss, who stopped in every morning, and my heart sank. It is amazing to think that they can go in and rob a store or a department store in broad daylight, and they get away with it all the time. Lex Bettner is Intelligence Bureau Chief for the Illinois State Police. But sometimes they can be in and out of a store in a matter of minutes and have, you know, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 in cash. They're called diversion burglaries. Instead of using violence, teams of thieves simply distract everyone in the store so their accomplices can sneak behind service counters or into store offices to find and pilfer safes. They really didn't stand out too much to me. I just thought they were, you know, regular customers coming in to purchase something. But police say these are anything but regular customers. Many of the perpetrators call themselves gypsies, but police call them members of Eastern European crime families. And they say some of the best in the business are led by this man, Angelo Morrow, and his wife, Sally. Even though police estimate Angelo and Sally Morrow have been arrested more than 50 times, it seems for the Morrows, crime pays. Coming up on our left is uh, the home where Angelo and Sally Morrow lived. The house listed for $875,000. Bittner believes nearly all of the diversion burglars are based in this Chicago suburb. She says as many as 40 families live within a five-mile radius of this town. It's from here they fan out all over the country in search of stores ripe for the robbing. The whole objective is to distract the employees in the store so that one or two people can make their way to, like, an office area or where the money is kept. Using surveillance tape from four separate locations, Bittner showed us what she says are the four carefully choreographed steps involved in almost all of these burglaries. First, the diversion. Bittner says the crooks manipulate employees by asking questions about products. We're back in the store Marla managed. You have three suspects all up at the front of the counter. Asking about wine, this woman lures Marla's co-worker away from the register. Now, this suspect is about to ask Marla for nutrition information. That's when she was asking me if we had no salt chips. Can you come over and help me, you know, see if you do have any? Marla says the would-be customer insisted Marla go with her to look for the special potato chips. We were standing about right through this area. That left the service counter where the money is, unattended and vulnerable for just a few minutes. This is like the farthest away you can be from the register is right here. Incredibly, the burglars are easily able to maneuver employees away from their posts. These burglars are making all the right moves. When this story continues, the tale of the surveillance tape will also continue. We will see how they finish the job. Special edition returns in just a moment. They're just watching to see if customers are coming through, if anyone's getting suspicious. Kind of just running interference and blocking. You have a woman right here. Uh, she grabs, this is an employee, she grabs her and uh, asks her to go this way. She, another employee comes, whoa, whoa, wait, come with me. You know, I don't want you going back there yet. Special edition continues now with another snapshot in the news. Buttercup the Bull's life on the run is over. The 2,000-pound beast escaped from a bull riding event in Spokane, Washington, and caused a fair amount of havoc on Interstate 90. The authorities tried to lure him with hay and cows, then to lasso him. But finally, it was a tranquilizer gun that slowed Buttercup down, and he was corralled. Now, once again, here's Lori Dew. As we return to our story, a police intelligence expert is showing us how certain burglaries are choreographed. 
It begins with diversion. Then once the employees are distracted, the team of thieves gets busy. Once again, here's Lee Thompson. Right now you'll see this particular female suspect motion. In this Palm Beach County, Florida store, Bittner says her. this woman is pretending uh, to be a customer. See the clerk follow her away from the counter? At a mini mart in Gainesville, Florida, this cashier leaves the counter to help another burglar posing as a shopper. These are her accomplices. In each case, after the clerks are distracted, the coast is clear for step two, the theft. In the store where Marla worked, she's in the back talking about potato chips, allowing the bandit to sneak behind the counter to the safe. Police say the suspect was able to swipe $4,000 cash. But how'd she get into the safe so easily? It was shot, but it wasn't locked. A lot of businesses during the daytime keep their uh, safes on what's called day lock. And where the safe is not fully locked or it may be even partially open so that it can get in and out of it to make change. Unfortunately, that means the burglars can get in too. In that grocery, with the service area unattended, these suspects head down the hallway toward the office. It's the same modus operandi in this department store in Arlington Heights, Illinois. There's the crook slipping into the office. First he's in the safe, and now he's checking the cash drawers. In the mini-mart, watch as this gutsy thief slinks behind the counter in search of the safe. And while she's grabbing the money, the others are there to make sure no one catches them red-handed. That brings us to step three, the blockade. She just kept distracting me, you know, picking up chips or, you know, anything to keep me from looking back there. From looking or going back to the counter. If she does, police say this man is ready to block her way. In the grocery store, Watch as these suspects form a human barrier at the hallway leading to the office. They're just watching to see if customers are coming through, if anyone's getting suspicious, kind of just running interference and blocking. They mill about, pull a card in to bolster the barricade, even try to block any view into the hallway by holding their newspapers high and wide. You have a woman right here. Uh, she grabs, this is an employee, she grabs her and uh, asks her to go this way. She's, another employee comes, whoa, whoa, wait, come with me. You know, I don't want you going back there yet. Now look carefully as other suspects emerge from the office. You can barely see Sally Morrow, who police say has lifted $7,000. But let's look again. Sally is empty-handed. If she has the money, where could it be? Police believe she stashed it in a garment like this. It's called a booster apron got strings around it, it goes around the waist, and then they wear their skirt over this apron. When they take the cash, the proceeds from the burglary are dropped into this, so no one suspects that they would have anything. They have nothing in their hand, so they're just walking out. And now the final step, the getaway. In Marla's store, they keep her diverted in the back while the money walks out. When Marla returns, the crime is already over. I thought... Everybody's leaving at once, and things are really hectic this morning. I said, you know, kind of odd. In the grocery store, the woman with the money departs first. Sometimes there's a signal. Police say you can see this woman waving the rest of the team out of the store. The surveillance tape from that department store shows the perpetrators filing out. Their take, about $5,000, and the grin seems to say it all. In the mini-mart, when the suspected thief pops up from behind the counter, most of the group begins to depart, except one accomplice who is still distracting the clerk in the back. But when he returns, he's suspicious. He checks the register, then the safe underneath, but it's too late. They are already out the door with $400. And if the heist goes bad, when the burglars think someone is on to them, these families are ready for that, too. In this market, the counter area is unattended. The crook is going for the money, but the store owner is suspicious. Listen to the commotion just off screen. As the owner races for the counter, this woman grabs him. The scuffle distracts him from the actual thief's escape. Now look again. During the fight, you can see the woman behind the counter slipping out unnoticed. The store owner and his son are so focused on the ruckus they don't see the crook get away with some of their cash. 
And in this Texas pawn shop, two burglars are already in the store's office to the right. But the job is going south. These women are blocking for the thieves. They rush the approaching store owner by lifting their skirts, pushing him back. As the women, who are trying to get to the money, leave, the owner races right by them. They'll scuffle with people to try to get out the door. Um, they'll do anything to get away. Police say these non-violent burglaries often get low priority. Many of the suspects we saw were caught, but Bittner says it's unlikely they'll all serve jail time. If they get caught, try to make restitution to avoid prosecution. So typically what happens is after they've stolen the money, they give the money back and they go free. If they get caught. If they get caught. And too often, because no one even realizes there's been a burglary, when the money is discovered missing, employees get accused. As for Marla, who was worried she'd be blamed for the crime in her store, lucky for her, there was that surveillance tape. As we were watching the video tape, it kind of made me sick to my stomach, because they're just, they're good, they are. They're, they're smooth, they're good, and you don't even know what's going on. Police have been able to make arrests in a number of these cases. Six people pleaded guilty to the theft at Marla Fairchild's Ohio store and are in jail awaiting sentencing. The crime at this Illinois department store led to five arrests. Three people pleaded guilty, but charges were dropped for this man and one other. And three people were convicted in the Texas pawn shop case. The woman in the white skirt was not arrested, but the one next to her entered a guilty plea as did the first woman seen walking out of the office area. The person behind her was never picked up. And Angelo Moro and his wife Sally were indicted with 16 others on charges stemming from several burglaries, including the one at this Florida grocery. They were expected to go on trial this year, but according to their lawyer, the couple has fled the country. One of those cellmates told police years ago, as well as last month, that Ramos had confessed to them, allegedly, that Aton was dead, that they would never find a body, and that he had sexually molested Aton Pates on the morning of his disappearance. Twenty-one years ago, missing children didn't seem to be a serious problem in this country. Their faces didn't stare back at you from milk cartons and posters. But it was 21 years ago that six-year-old Aton Pates disappeared. He would become a symbol for missing children. Now, at long last, police say they have some answers. Will there finally be some closure in this case of a little boy lost? Here's Patty Ann Brown. There's this whole unanswered uh, mystery just hanging over the household, and it stays there. One spring morning in 1979, a blonde six-year-old boy left his home in New York City to walk two blocks to meet his school bus. Aton Pates was carrying his blue school bag with elephants on it. He had finally convinced his mother, Julie, to let him make the short trip by himself. We found out that he did not come home on the school bus and, in fact, had never reached school that morning. Aton Pates had vanished. And as the days, then weeks, turned into months, then years. Hundreds of investigators and volunteers joined the Pates family in searching for their son. For the first few years after Aton disappeared, Stan and Julie Pates spoke out often in hopes of finding their son. Usually there is something, something happens that's a clue or something that indicates what might, might have happened. This particular situation, there was nothing, so it seems to indicate that that he has been taken, he is being kept somewhere. We're doing well, but there is a strain that doesn't stop. It eats away a little bit more every day. But as time passed, hopes of finding Aton alive faded. Eventually, most of the detectives were reassigned. Still, the Aton Pates case remained an open investigation. And now, 21 years later, police may finally have the break they need to solve this case. Scott Weinberger has investigated the case for New York television station WNBC. Jose Antonio Ramos 
um, was somebody police always believed was involved in this case, but never had enough evidence, let alone circumstantial evidence, to bring him to a grand jury. 55-year-old Jose Ramos is a convicted sex offender who was a friend of Aton Pates' babysitter. He reportedly admitted to investigators in 1988 that he was with Aton on the morning the boy vanished, but he has long denied any involvement in his disappearance. Why I was taken off the streets in New York City without an arrest warrant, questioned for eight hours, and made to say <laughs> it didn't even happen. Regarding what? Regarding the Pates case. The case against Ramos was reinvigorated recently in a twist of fate. A young boy who in 1979 lived in the same building as Ramos. He knew Ramos and Ramos knew him. 20 years later, this year, he's a New York City detective. And he was brought into this case. The reason to go back to that building and talk to the neighbors who still live there who would not talk to detectives in 1979. And he was able to gain important information. New information. Weinberger says police sources have told him that they finally have enough evidence to charge someone in Aton Pates' disappearance. And there's more. Police also went back to the places where Ramos were in prison and interviewed two of his cellmates. And one of those cellmates told police years ago, as well as last month, that Ramos had confessed to them, allegedly, that Aton was dead, that they would never find a body, and that he had sexually molested Aton Pate on the morning of his disappearance. And in one of his alleged confessions, he told this cellmate, in fact, he drew a map, and in this map he put an X at the Pate's residence, an X where he lived, and also put an X where he picked up Aton, allegedly the morning of May 25, 1979. Now, investigators took that map from that cellmate, brought it to an FBI lab, and a handwriting expert confirmed that the handwriting was Jose Ramos. It won't be difficult to find Jose Ramos. Since 1987, he's been locked up in a Pennsylvania prison for molesting two boys in two separate incidents. One of those cases was prosecuted by Stuart Grabois, one of the former investigators in the Pates case. It was my belief that that individual was responsible for the disappearance of Aton Pates. After more than 13 years in prison, Jose Antonio Ramos has petitioned the Pennsylvania Parole Board for release and could be set free as early as September. But former investigator Stuart Grabois vows not to let that happen. We'll do everything within our power to make sure he doesn't step foot outside. Special Edition contacted the Pates family for this story. Stanley Pates, Aton's father, declined our request for an interview, but said the family, quote, welcomes any development in this case toward an indictment. The New York City police told us they had no comment on the Aton Pates case because it's an open investigation. We'll be right back. And finally, there are handicapped parking spots, so why not special provisions for pregnant women? Well, that is just what the people at the Sweetheart Market in Syracuse, New York, were thinking when they set aside a few spaces for maternity parking. The store's manager says he just wants to make shopping easier. He is even willing to give his male customers a break for accidentally parking in a pregnant spot. And that is Special Edition. I'm Lori Dew. Thank you for watching.